Hello, my friends, and welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. If your day is going well, I hope it keeps going well. If it's not headed in that direction yet, well, I hope this is a nice distraction and it gets better for you soon, as Lucas Bretz always says. So today we are talking about true diversity within an aquarium. So a lot of folks will think of diversity in an aquarium and think that means I have a lot of plant species and a lot of fish species. Well, that's one type, but specifically I want to go over what you can do to actually build a diverse ecosystem that has hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of different species from bacteria to fungi to little water skippers to you know, you name it, micro crustaceans, shrimp, snails, black worms, nematodes, whatever you can imagine that's small in that microcosm under the microscope, we can build that into our aquarium and then we don't need to feed our fish. We don't need to concentrate the nutrition for our plants the same way or tender the substrate the same way. In fact, when we have that complexity that usually is only achieved with somewhere between three to five or six years of having an aquarium, that's how long it will take you with water changes, introducing new fish, introducing dozens of new plants, changing things around, putting your hands in, things just floating in from your outside environment. That's how a lot of the spores and a lot of the little microorganisms end up in your tank. And that takes time and they all need to kind of establish and balance naturally. And if one just pops in all of a sudden, if you just dump a bunch of one in, it's not going to work. So we're going to go over the method that I have developed and I hadn't really shared until recently of how to culture this type of aquarium. If you guys like the way this looks, if you want an aquarium, you can leave for a week two weeks even I've left these. And the only problems I ever have is when someone overfeeds them. These tanks can go two weeks, even with fish as big as angelfish, with food aplenty. And so we're going to go over what it takes, what the different food groups are that you're trying to build in your aquarium and in your little ecosystem, and the benefits of all this micro diversity, things like how it helps concentrate nutrition and how it helps stratify the substrate. And if you look at it over here, you can actually see that things like iron over a long period, this substrate's about five years old now, it starts to stratify out and you can actually tell where the oxygen is no longer reaching under. And you can start to see a little bit of anaerobic or even anoxic life forming in there. And a lot of people try really hard to establish that. We're not going to be spending the whole video though focusing on substrate or plant diversity or talking about how you need a sort of cleanup crew of algae eaters and maybe you want some neurites and some uh, autosynclus and some quarries to eat the food that the other fish miss or shrimp to clean up the other food and help eat the algae. And you'll see in these tanks, I do have algae. I have several kinds of algae. I probably have a dozen kinds of algae in some of these tanks and bodies of snails and the calcium and the carbonate that they leave behind as well. I'm not gravel vacuuming them. This is a very naturalistic focused uh, way to keep tanks. And beyond having a good light so that the tanks can grow, maybe adding a little bit of phosphates or nitrates if you don't have enough of those, believe it or not. Most people have a problem keeping their nitrates down. In a tank that's diversified at this bacterial and fungal level as well as your microbiome level, you're going to have the opposite problem. So if you like the way these tanks look, if you want to hear more about the benefits of keeping tanks like this, if you want these lush tanks where you do have algae, you do have things like this, but I don't even clean the glass in this tank here. 
you know, there's a little bit of spot algae and diatome algae on the glass, but no one algae is overpowering this tank. There's also Maramo algae over there. And you can see, see these little white dots moving around along the glass? Those are all little creatures and life forms that are living in the tank, as are the snails. Again, this is an older tank, and you can see the stratified substrate. So we're going to go over all of this, and we're going to first talk about the benefits that it has and how great this is for your aquarium when you set it up wanting it this style of tank and the things that this will help you achieve having this diversity and then we're going to go over the five different trophic levels of organisms so there's those that we don't see as much like the bacteria and the archaea and fungi and things like that we don't necessarily see them unless they're growing huge in a colony or something and in all of my tanks that you're seeing here they all have been inoculated with my system that we're going to go over at the end and we're going to also talk about where and how to get a hold of just a few of these things if there's some of them you want like maybe you just want daphnia and scuds so that your uh, mid-sized fish and baby fish uh, we'll have some extra food living in the aquarium. So we'll we'll talk about where where you can get those things. And in another video I've already talked about, like I said, if you want something that eats at the top, something that eats algae, something that eats in the middle, we've already gone over that in other uh, planted tank ecosystem uh, videos. But in this one, we're going to go over the amazing hundreds, if not thousands of species of creatures from little flora, microflora, and little microfauna that can live emerged, immersed, submerged in your aquarium or in your riparium or paludarium and talk about what each of those little trophic levels is and then at the end I'll show you how I've achieved this and how I've essentially inoculated my tanks by a method that I don't know of anybody else doing uh, short of just going to a pond and throwing a random cup in which there are some problems with and we'll discuss that uh, as the video progresses but let's jump in all right so the real foundation of these tanks is not necessarily plants or fish i mean that will determine what you want your microbiome to look like but what's really going to shape it is the microbiome and what fits in the temperature and in the uh, plants, substrate, and minerals and nutrients that you've put in the water already. So that is what will shape your food pyramid. That's what will shape your food web within your tanks. So let's go over why this is so beneficial for your aquariums. So beyond being fish food for fry, we know they like small, small creatures and microorganisms, and so do large fish. But why do we need these microorganisms? Well, they help increase color. They help increase spawning and the turnaround time in between uh, the time that fish take to spawn because the fish are able to pack on complex micronutrients and fatty acids and all sorts of things like color enhancing anthocyanins and carotenoids or carotenoids as you guys uh, have corrected me to say but all sorts of other vitamins and minerals also which are created or or rather made accessible by your microbiome so they may be in your vegetables or even in your plants or the food you put in your tank but it may not be accessible and so many of these life forms break it down one level and then maybe another will break it down even more and another will pull say the sulfur out and another will bond the sulfur to an oxygen and you'll have a uh, sulfur oxide and maybe that's the one thing like in a gas form that the plant needs in order to absorb it I mean I'm just throwing something out there but it it makes it so that you have this level of complexity that is missing which we usually would see in nature and your baby fish really need that it also signals the parents that hey there's food for the babies it also helps in in concentrating those nutrients in the slime coat of your fish and their uh, their their color and looks and how quickly they grow and breed but also 
in their actual autoimmune system. That is determined in large part by these microorganisms. Just like the gut biome in humans, there's the same thing in fish. And just as it can be helpful, there is a chance that you could put something in there that's harmful. But if you're putting it in there from a body of water that doesn't have a fish as a host or a vector for illness, it's much lower uh, chances that you're going to introduce some sort of parasite uh, into that environment. And we'll go over that when we go outside and I show you how to do this all the way I do it. But beyond this, I mean, each of these trophic levels has something else to offer. So there's some that clean up waste, you know, some that break down fish poop like shrimp and they can eat stuff off that or snails. And then something that can eat the snail casting or the protein off the snails and then something eats those things and so on and so forth. Some of these things keep your algae at a level where it can't bloom. And other things are, you know, a, diver a diversity of algae. So you have 10 types of algae, but no one is going to be able to take over. And they actually have little chemical wars and fight each other. And you're, in the meantime, your plants are able to thrive. So there are so many reasons why you may want to actually have uh, this sort of a complexity in your tank. And it goes on and on. But we can talk about that more in another video. And if you want to achieve this partially, you can always go out and buy a monoculture of something like scuds. I've got a whole video on that. You can have a tank set aside in your fish room and just take scuds as you need them. If you just want to feed live food to fish that will only eat live food, you can do that. But we're talking about inoculating your tank or enriching it with hundreds, if not thousands of species and that takes time and the layers of uh, life that form are really kind of split up into five main layers within the aquarium world and the first layer is the nano layer and that's everything from your nitrifying bacteria your beneficial bacteria your cyanobacteria your archaea uh, and even viruses and molds fungi uh, very small single cell algae and single cell life that's super, super teeny. And that's all within your nano size or your nanotrophic scale. Whereas the second part of the pyramid would be your simple cell, uh, simple single cell organisms, your protozoas, your single cell amoebas, spores from your fungi and things like that, paramecium, uh, infusoria, and maybe some of the smaller simple little creatures that we see. Now the third layer of that trophic pyramid, food web, food pyramid, is visible. So in theory you can see it with your eyes and arguably yeah you can see infusoria with your eyes uh, if you hold it up just right in the light and you know you can see a dusty cloudy look but we're talking about actually being able to see the life forms and that's when we get to things like um, things like vinegar eels things like water fleas or daphnia isopods rotifers uh, copepods uh, cyclops, daf you know, the daphneas and the micro crustaceans, water mites, or, uh, you know, sometimes people call daphnia water fleas, but there's also the little jumping fleas and mites on top of your water. That's all going to be in that third layer of kind of barely visible. And then you get to your fourth layer of macro visible, and that's your snails, your shrimp, your detritus worms, planaria, which a lot of people in a shrimp tank, for instance, that's a pest. You don't want it around. But if it's in a tank full of fish, they may eat it. My bettas love eating it. My gudgeons and gobies, they love eating planaria. So basically, they just eat any extra fish food if I'm trying to feed my fish actual food just for the sake of enriching them and nutrients. And then they uh, metabolize that, put it into the tank, it goes into my plants, and then I don't need to fertilize the plants nearly as much. I like that whole ecosystem and the way it kind of uh, works with one another rather than 
you know, I don't just leave the fish to eat only what's in the tank always. I'll feed them a few days a week, but the other times a day, then they're constantly foraging and active and looking for these trophic levels and these creatures, you know, and that can include even your fish that are fry fish in this level four macro level, uh, black worms, which will go into the substrate and live blood worms. Uh, you can get live or frozen cyclops, triops, you know, bigger critters, uh, that can live in your tank. And also usually they have a function that's pretty visible, like, uh, eating algae or eating diatoms or eating bacteria and fungi, uh, biofilms. Then level five on your trophic pyramid is going to be your actual fish, your fish that are in the tank, your bigger plants that are in the tank, complex plants with root systems and things. And that kind of completes our trophic levels. So you can go out and like I said, you could go buy each of these things. You could go to Aquatic Arts and get uh, a starter kit of, uh, you know, if you just want white worms or micro worms, I get it if you just want to raise fry from a little bit of, say, some gourami or something that you have or a betta that hatched um, a, a, a clutch of, of babies. But really, with most of those things, uh, like paramecium and infusoria on the lower levels, you can create that at home for free. It's those medium levels that you may want to go out and seek. But I'm going to show you guys in just a moment how you can get the cyclops, the daphnia, lots of these different creatures, everything up to level five even, uh, just from putting it outside, even in a suburban neighborhood by using tubs and a little bit of time, maybe by going to local parks and ponds and things like that. But the way I do that is I put these batches outside and over time I create different biomes and niches or niches, however you want to say that. Uh, and I allow different tubs, some alkaline, some, uh, acidic, some neutral, to work off of different things. So some may have some moss and some algae, some may have plants that live in there. Some may just be bare bottom plastic tubs, but they all sit and wait. Some are in shade, some are in sun. And I take samplings of all those. And I'm going to show you that outside and we're going to go over some more of the details and things like that. But I want to show you how I create what I think is the most ideal way to do this. I also want to mention that when I do that outside, I put these in uh, jars and I usually will put it in a gallon jar or so at a time for say a 20 gallon tank or 40 gallon tank. And I will, before I even put fish in, I'll have the plants, the substrate and that stuff in, but I won't have fish in or more than a couple fish in. And I will let that jar sit a while, make sure there's no insects that are flying insects like dragonflies or mosquitoes that are going to be an issue in the fish room or be an issue to my fish. Also, I look out for leeches and anything that, that just seems a little off. So it's kind of my QT period, but I've still never come across anything from even my local ponds and things that was harmful. Now, I don't live in the tropics, and if you live in the tropics and you're getting it from an area where there's lots of fish in the water, that's a whole different story. And that's where you might want to work on a system like the one I have and the one we're going to check out right now outside. All right, guys, so we are outside and it is beautiful. Spring has sprung and this is the perfect time of year to set up your tubs. So if you are eight, your own diversity, your own microflora, microfauna and diversity in your aquarium, this is how you can do it. So let me just tell you real quick. Yes, I know this looks a little redneck or whatever, and you can put it on a shelf and make it look all organized if you want or dress it up, make it look fancy. But basically all you need is Tupperware containers or buckets that will hold water. Now, some of them you definitely want at least uh, 10 or 15 gallons uh, because you're going to get different diversity, larger creatures and just bigger colonies of algae and other things like that because your water parameters aren't going to shift quite as drastically with things like the sun and the temperature, the larger the water uh, volume is. But I'm going to start off by telling you guys that this tank here that looks like it's speckled in lumps of black 
Those are called alfuks, and they are layers of dozens of different creatures, different uh, bacteria, different fungi, different single cell organisms, different uh, multi cell organisms, and they're all living together symbiotically in this kind of layer of protein and uh, the protoplasm that actually fills up cell uh, in between cell membranes and organelles ends up spilling out into some of these and sometimes then the algae will create the cell wall holding it all in so it actually becomes almost like uh, a transformer it almost becomes like one large uh, organism on the surface area of of tanks and ponds or rivers and lakes so in here we have an alkaline source with nothing on the bottom other than leaves that have fallen in over the last year and you can see what the algae and the uh alfuchs look like they are quite a bit different than the other tanks so i just want to show you there's some that are clumpy and over here we've got some that almost look like uh like a, a fuzzy shag carpet or something well then we also have over in here we've got the other alkaline tub and this one has red algae and even though it has red algae it's still growing daphnia and it's also growing if we can get them to show up these cyclops However, the cyclops happen to be orange and red, so they're getting something out of there, whether it's iron or who knows what, that's growing in the algae and the cyanobacteria and bacteria and fungi. Uh, and this is all different, and the color and the thickness of the container will also change that. I also put an old uh, container from an aquarium that had uh, already a, a rich layer of mulm on it that was for a fry container. So I put that in there. I'll put things like old nets or old plant decor and things like that into certain tanks in order to in inoculate the tank with new things. Now over here is a shallow little pond and what's different about this one is if we scoop around here you'll see that we have little baby sticklebacks living in here and the fact that there are fish in here means that there is an entire nitrogen cycle that has cycled up in here and the leaf litter and the algae and that stuff, even in the winter here, there's just lava rocks at the bottom and rainwater in here, will give it a completely different biological makeup than the alkaline uh, water right here that has the kind of reddish brown hue. This one's very black and dark. Well, then we come over to here, and this is a 45 gallon tub, and this one turns into my green water tank supply every year and that's because the black I think absorbs heat better than the other ones and you end up with kind of almost excess heat in here and if we take a look and we can get the, rid of the glare here let's try to get rid of it it has a thick shag carpet of sorts of algae and uh, bacteria and alfuchs and it also has things kind of like a spider webby layer uh, up top but the green runs all the way around and on the bottom and there's leaves and some root tabs and plants in there that gave that its its uniqueness now over here these are my favorite tubs in that these also uh, are just water with rocks at the bottom so neutral but then all the algae and stuff that has grown on the leaves and all the rich uh, tannins and things that are in these ones have turned them around 5.5 or 6 pH. And they also have a different uh, bacteria and alfuch layer. Also, these are absolutely exploding with life. I mean, under the microscope, there are dozens of species. And uh, we'll look at a couple of those in just a moment of what is hiding in your aquarium and in your ponds. If you live anywhere in North America or uh, Europe or Asia, any of the uh, kind of 
subtropic or temperate uh, latitudes as well but in here we've got all sorts of cyclops living and those are absolutely wonderful for your fish they get the tannins and the energy out of algae and out of the leaves that are in here and they take that energy and they take the nutrients and they end up being a perfect little packet for your fish but these will breed in your aquarium so you can literally just target a species if you want like here here's a little male uh cyclops he looks like a little tadpole and these ones are white whereas we have cyclops that are orange and yellow in this ecosystem in this bucket and it's just a bucket i mean but look how different the water color is and everything and that's all down to bacteria and the ph and the sunlight and all of these things can dictate that changing now beyond all this mosquitoes and flying insects and things like that will be able to get into tubs like this and depending on where you live and what insects are around you'll need to be careful and make sure that you're not putting things like dragonfly larva into your aquarium. That's really the most harmful thing in most cases. I've never really had a problem with bacteria or parasites from doing this, uh, this type of thing, which is where I take all these, and then what I will do if it's an acidic tank is I'll take samples from all the neutrals in the acidic, and I'll put them in a jar and I'll get a turkey baster that's sitting right there. And I will get as much of it uh, broken up from the bottom as possible, squirt it together into a murky jar. And, you know, some from the top, some from the bottom, some from the middle, some of the floating chunks, some of the biofilm I'll scrape off, all of that. And I will then bring it up to temperature in the room, wherever the aquarium is. And then as long as it isn't turning like a rancid smell or something like that with the lid off and everything, then once it's up to temperature, 70 degrees or so, whatever is going to live in there, I usually give it a week to, you know, do its thing. And then I will put it into an aquarium. And that is how you can jump start if you have no one helping you. But now you can get live cultures, places like Aquatic Arts. The link is in the description for a discount and everything too. But you can also buy it from friends, from fish clubs, and all sorts of ma mail order places. So you can skip these steps and get some of the microfauna. But if you really want the true diversity of what could be in your tanks, what could be in a pond, you have to really go to the source. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this long, deep dive into uh, making your tank the most sustainable, balanced ecosystem you can. Me and my stray cat, Silky, we really thank you. And we would uh, absolutely love it if you guys could give us a thumbs up and share it. Watch more videos if you like it. All that stuff is awesome. Uh, if we've earned it, you know, watch away. Uh, if we haven't, boy, you wasted a lot of time here. Anyways, I hope your day goes great, and I will see you guys on the next one. If you really want to help curate the channel and the content here, see behind-the-scenes stuff and get a whole bunch of extra episodes of Fishery, the audio-based updates of the fish world, over 180 episodes, uh, $1.99 a month. Keeps things going, keeps the lights on, so to speak, and... Uh, I get lots of great ideas from all you members. So thank you regardless of if you're a member or a subscriber or a passerby. Take care, and I'll see you next time.